Hello, and welcome to another episode of the William Branham Historical Research Podcast. I'm your host, John Collins, the author and founder of William Branham Historical Research at william-branham.org. And with me, I have my very special guests, Faye and Michael Prasick, former message believer and Christian who now understands how weird this is to be a former message believer. Faye, Michael, it's very good to have you. Um, I was so excited when Faye contacted me and said that she wanted to be on here to tell her story because I, <clears throat> from off to the sidelines, I have been watching the story um, bits and pieces of it after it had unfolded. And then I, I'm now coming to understand the bigger story and what you guys have been through. I can say it, ha- it was a very difficult time. I can tell everyone who's listening that you guys have really been through it. And part of the reason I'm so excited to have you both on here is to see somebody who has gone through what you've gone through and came out so strong on the other side. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've definitely been through our fair share of, of trials, hardships, and we're in a good place. You know, it's it's always an uphill climb, but it, we're in a good place. And Michael, for you, I can't even imagine what it would be like having not grown up in this and suddenly coming in contact with this whole world of weird. I don't know if you, I was a, a Superman fan and I watched the show called Smallville and there's a there's a lady on there who just also happened to be in a cult, but she had this wall of weird in the show. And I, I kind of feel like you're married into this wall of weird now that you see all of this. What's it like being married to somebody who was who was in this thing and you weren't? Um, it was tough. I mean, you know, you love the woman and, you know, that's that's all that mattered to me. Right. I, she was who she was. I am who I am. And. I was willing to, you know, pretty much kind of do most anything, you know, obviously to, to just be with her and, you know, because we love each other and I couldn't live without her. So, but, uh, yeah, the kind of sudden introduction into it when it all really came to light was, uh, what planet are we on now? I mean, (laughs) I, I, I mean, you know, I, 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 tried to entertain it, you know, I gave it about five seconds worth of thought and the things that I heard just floored me. And I just said, it's not for me. I, you know, you do you. Okay. I'm not going to change you. I'm not going to change me. We're going to be together and, you know, we'll just, uh, we'll get through this. Although secretly I was hoping maybe I could talk some sense into her lately or eventually. And I thought I was going to convert him. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so we were, uh, we both had our agendas, but uh, in, in the end, we just, you know, we loved each other and that's all that really mattered to me. Yeah. When he first met me, he just accepted me for who I was. Um, I came from, you know, born and raised in the message and um, I loved God. I, I wanted to know so much about the message and I was one of those women that I didn't want to just be off and and, you know, just separated from the fellowship, I started digging in and like really reading the message and learning it inwards, outwards, backwards, reading everything I get my hands on, listening to anything I could, because I just wanted to be a part. I wanted to know everything. I didn't want to be ignorant and have someone tell me. I wanted to be the person that knew and say, like, yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. I understand what you're saying and I could follow along. So I knew it very well, too. Um my challenges came, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, John, but I came from a very abusive uh, marriage. Um, we were trying to get away, and um, I, it took a lot of effort. Um, this is very sensitive, a very sensitive topic, and I want to be very delicate to the people that I know. Um, but, you know, I was even looking for a shelter to live. Um, a lot of people try to steer me away from that because they said, if I'm in a shelter, then my kids are exposed to, you know, thieves and bed bugs. And they just said, that's not the environment. So, you know, I tried to turn to family. Um, they helped, but it was always pushing me back, even though they didn't believe that they did to my marriage. Um, and then, you know, I, I, there's so much that I can add to this that I'm just, I just want to be sensitive again to the people that are involved. 
So I'll just kind of like leave that out. People are welcome to reach out to me if you want to hear the whole story. I, I will definitely share. Um, but ultimately, that is why I left my marriage. And in my mind, I believed that I would rather, because I met Michael um, shortly after I was trying to leave, right? Um, and he was, you know, it started off with just meeting and then, um, eventually it became to where I was living with him. Um, I'm cutting, I'm admitting a lot out. Um, but you know, just, he didn't really know a whole lot except for I wore dresses, didn't wear makeup, not allowed to cut my hair. I mean, he just knew very, very minimal things about me. Um, and he just, he accepted me for who I was, never tried to change me, never tried to put any pressure on me. He was very, very respectful. But in my mind, I believed that if we got married, um, cause you know, I went through divorce too, that I would be okay with going to hell as long as my children were safe. And that's what I look back on it. That's ridiculous. To feel like you have to live alone for the rest of your life or stay with your husband for the rest of your life. It was it felt like a prison sentence. And I didn't want to be in that place. So to me, the, the reality was I'll just be able to go to hell. I can live with this. It's so hard. I can't even imagine being a female in this. I've had, I've done a, several of these stories now. And as you know, I've been working with male and female in the support groups. A lot of women went through similar things where they were in a, either an abusive relationship with their husband, or in some cases, they just weren't really a good fit for each other. But in the message, you're stuck. You make this decision. If you're female, you're stuck. And then depending on which flavor of the message you were in, some of the men could remarry, the women couldn't. And in other sects, you, you know, male and female, you could not. Can't even imagine what that was like. But in some cases, the the people who are in the church will actually go after the children of the woman who has been, you know, separated from the husband. Is Did that happen to you? Yes. Um, some of my family members um, advised my two oldest daughters, which at the time they were adults, um, that because I was living in sin, um, which would mean in a relationship with my husband now, um, that it was... I was sinning against God that it was that I was living in sin that um, that they could not be a part of that um, because they're adults and um, I did get to talk to them very briefly but they you know they maintain a, a wall towards me because you know they were afraid um, they were afraid of any, any influence because you know they were advised that I had a demon on me or I was I was possessed with spirits and you know so they had to be really careful when they talked to me and I think a lot of the things when we would communicate they read and help them to respond because it didn't sound like my kids when they would respond back to me uh, I have five children and so that is also it's very hard for a mother that has had no education and you're kind of raised not kind of you're you're, you're raised to be barefoot and in the kitchen and um, education was not encouraged not not for us not for women so you know when i tried to leave to go on my own it was either a shelter um i looked for weeks and weeks for battered women um alternatives just to find somewhere to to live with my kids i, I was trying to live on my own because i wanted to do the right thing um and then that's when I met Michael and that, that my story kind of evolves from there too. But, um, yeah, it, it was, it was hard because they were also advised that it was best for them to stay with their dad. And at the time, um, you can, John, you feel free to take this out if you don't feel that it's necessary to fit the story. But at the time, um, they were oh, neglected. John, they're, they're, they were neglected. It was, it, was, it was horrible. That must have been so difficult to watch your children be taken away from you like that. And, you know, you're the mother. I know that in 
every religion there are marital issues so we can't say that it's directly applied to the message but I do know that from at least from what the people have told me who have been in this and who have escaped as soon as the male or female decides to leave the cult or decides not to adhere to the cult's rules a lot of times they're they're severed as a parent and then the children are no longer even emotionally connected to them and sometimes they're you know the well-being of the child is not really thought through in those cases what happened after they severed that connection i well they they were made to they were convinced they were coerced they were made to believe that no matter how much suffering they may have to endure it, anything was better than to be involved with mom, to be involved in mom's situation, to, to live with mom, uh, just because of our relationship, you know, whether that meant going without food or, you know, poor conditions or no heat or, you know, neglect or whatever that meant, it, it was still the best route. It was still in God's favor, how they put it, to shun mom. And for the longest time, for the better part of a year, she had almost no contact with them. I mean, they just, and if it was, it was very rigid. It was very um, shaming. Uh, like the kids were playing mom role this time and saying, you're bad and what you're doing is wrong. And, and you know, it's like a flip flop of roles and, and witnessing this, it was just, I, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, the children are playing this role and they're made to believe that they, this is what they should be doing. And I, I just didn't understand that. And I think the hard part for Michael is I think I spent most of my days crying my eyes out. Yeah. And it was hard on him yeah, to warm sure. up. That's really difficult watching that happen to your children. I've had several people contact me who have gone through similar situations. And I'll never forget one of the first ladies that contacted me. She was not quite of an age to be out on her own however she also you know in the cult you don't have proper education sometimes and especially if you're female you don't have a means to support yourself and according to her she was kicked out of the house and living in the car and had been for i think she told me it was over a year that she'd been living in the car because the parents would not let her in the house and she didn't have proper food, proper care. You know, it, it's awful what happens. And again, you can't directly say that that's a message rule and the message promotes this thing. But what I'm seeing is that it is somewhat common that this is happening. And it's mind boggling that a religion can take the natural instincts of a human to care for another human away from the people. It, it just blows your mind. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> well, on the brighter side, though, I was able to convince them to <laughs> come back with me on a trial basis. I had to, um, to, to go to Indiana to pick up her car because when I flown out, when we got married, because we got married in Indiana, um, we left her <laughs> car there and all drove back together in my truck. So I flew back, picked up the car, and I stopped by in Colorado on the way back in to for her family and for her daughters. And I'm like, look, you know, I can take care of your dogs, your cats, you guys, your mom misses you. Just come spend a couple of weeks and come hang out. And uh, was able to convince them to actually get in the car. And uh, once we did that, then um, got them back home. And they, they lived with us for the better part of the next year and uh, really helped to mend that relationship. You know, there was always still the, okay, we don't believe it. We're just going to say we don't believe in what you're doing, but we are family. So yeah. I think that was, you know, uh, a, you know, a, con uh, a testament to their, their importance of family to them, how much they really did love their mother, no matter what they were being, tell being told. So, um, you know, in the end that, that did work out. In fact, uh, the oldest daughter still lives with us today. So, um, yeah. yeah, and it's been a, you know, it, had to work really hard at yeah. rebuilding, so I'm thankful for that. You mentioned accepting the fact that you're going to hell. That's another common thing that I've heard from the females, which it blows your mind, right? In Christianity, it blows it does, your it mind. It sounds awful hearing myself say that. Well, yeah. Let me add to that. 
<laughs> I asked her to marry me, and she goes, well, all right, I'm going to choose you and just choose to go to hell. How? What's that do for you? <laughs> I ego, remember huh? saying that. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I got an ego about me being. <laughs> well, well, see, this was in, in the message. This was not possible for me. I was one of the blessed people that was under my grandfather's blessing from the prophet guy. He told my grandfather that all of your children and all of your grandchildren will be saved. So I had this blanket statement of <laughs> free salvation, right? It's like the monopoly get out of jail free card, right? That's so. <laughs> <laughs> Two tickets to paradise, right? <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> but so they they implanted this in your head that you're doomed to hell, you have no chance. But yet, I, I've mentioned there's some similarities in your story and to the others. One of the other similarities, which is ironic to me, you, like me, knew the message. You knew it inside and out. You studied it. And I have found another common... It. I, in my mind, it was exactly. It was God's word. It was salvation. And <laughs> exactly, I did too. Even though I don't think a single person in it understands salvation, but that's another story for another day. <clears throat> but I found this common thread. Right, the people who know it the most are the ones who usually escape because it's so riddled with internal contradictions that eventually, if you know it, you're going to find something that's just critically flawed with it what was the what was the eye-opening thing that you first found with as a flaw this is where my story changes into a different direction but for me it was never about riddled with confusion yes it is however that's not how we're taught we're taught never to question what we believe we're taught if we don't understand it just put it on the shelf or just like God will reveal it later. So you don't question it. So, and I didn't. Um, it was very fearful for me to start questioning. Um, I remember um, because I was uh, married, um, I was given 30 days to leave my husband um, from family members that um, was advised from a certain individual that I shall not name. But um, they gave me 30 days to leave my husband and I was in desperation. I remember just crying a lot and um, he was crying a lot. And I just, I never felt, cause they said, you know, you have to trust what God leads you to do. I never felt that God was telling me to leave him. Never, not once. Although I was pressured through scripture and through quotes, it was, what family and family just mm -hmm. it was constant bombardment of we love you but this you need to be corrected and um that was that was repeated like a lot um and then i think it was a few days after the 30 days because something happened and they did, wasn't able to turn me over to the devil although that was still there uh, my son broke his neck and that's where it gets it spirals kind of downhill. Um, my son, if anybody wants to look on the news, Joshua Southworth, or if anyone wants to um, just look through pictures that I have posted in the past, they can very easily see that um, my son suffered and we have people from all around the world praying for him. Um, but two weeks into it, we were, I was um, given an email from a family member on behalf of an individual. And it basically said that I was to be shunned, that my sins caused my son's accident, that God, I had, that God had no, God was not with me anymore, that he had on his own released me from the protection of the church. Um, that, it, 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 it would come back to me from multiple people, from multiple sources that other churches was, was warned of me to stay away from me, to shun me. People that I knew and the community that I had loved stopped having anything to do with me. They still don't have anything to do with me. Well, to um, not pray for you or Joshua. Yeah, they, they the were advised thing. to not pray mm -hmm. for Joshua and not pray for me because it was God's will. And they likened my situation to, um, William Branham's life story and the life story would um, be about his wife in the flood that um, because of William Branham's disobedience, 
that um, his wife got sick and died and then the baby died because of his disobedience. So that was put on to me and projected to me. And I just remember it was hard enough being in the hospital in the ICU with my son fighting for his life. My son is uh, C4, C5 quadriplegic. He, uh, four days in, he had lost the battle of being able to breathe on his own and they had to put him on a ventilator. My world had turned upside down very, very quickly. And then to believe, which I did at the time, that my son's accident was my fault, there are no words. You cannot explain that into words of the devastation a human being has to endure for that. And they told me that if I did not leave my husband, that my son will never, ever be healed. So this is the hard part. Even though my husband was the biggest support for me, I mean the biggest support for me, I told him, Michael, you have to leave. You cannot be in the hospital with me. You need to go so my son has a chance to live. And he broke down crying and he said, I'm not leaving you, Faye. I'm not. He said, I will go sit in the parking lot. I will live in the parking lot if this gives you peace, but I am not leaving you. And my husband never left me, not once. And I don't know if that's in a test of love. I don't know what is. So I'm trying to keep my composure. So I apologize, but. I also told her they need to get a bigger orderly if they want to meet me. So. He always gives me something to smile about so I can get through it. I'm, I'm glad you did because I'm struggling to keep my composure. This is <laughs> this, this is a very difficult story. And, and I knew the story before we went in. I've You know, like I said, I've watched the story uh, as it was unfolding. And I can't even imagine. I mean, <clears throat> you look at the Bible. You look at Jesus with the woman at the well or any of these stories. Jesus went to the people that needed the help right it wasn't that he was condemning and this church pretends to preach jesus but whatever this thing is that they're calling jesus that's not the jesus of the bible and to think that they're condemning the, the people who need them the most the people that are the ones that they're condemning i just have to say it angers me one of the things that we always talked about is what happened to going after the one lost the, the story about the, sh the, the lost sheep, what happened to, what is it that, what's the story where you're, you, 990, whatever it is, it's, it's the story of the one, you go after the lost. Yeah. If I am lost, why didn't they go after me? Why did they have to shun me during the worst time of my life? There was a lot of people that did not know of the shunning, and those are the ones that still remained praying for me. You know, I was, I, was, I was thankful just for prayers of anybody because I got to a point where I convinced myself that God did not hear my prayers. And even if I prayed, it would just go to the ceiling and fall down to the, to the floor. In other words, there was there was nothing God heard. Well, and even, you feel hopeless. Yeah, but the hospital chaplain came down to console, counsel. That's, I figured if I can't, if he can't hear my prayers, I'll get a chaplain in there. So, you know, <laughs> and then she tells the story to the chaplain. He's like, he was so angry. He was speechless. And then he, yeah, he was, he's he like, was I'm so upset angry. Over it. He, goes, yeah. he goes, these people are, what they're doing to you is wrong. He goes, God hears your prayers. Cause that's what she thought. And I didn't believe God it. God doesn't hear your prayers. And, they can't, they can't tell, you know, and I always, cause I'm like, she's did this turning over this and 30 days that, and I'm like, well, you think God's over there going, Hey, good, good catch, man. That one almost got by me, you know, <laughs> <laughs> goodness. I got you guys looking out for my best interest. Right. And I'm like, does that really make sense to you? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. But you're so, you're so, what's the word cognitive distance? You're so lost in what you've been taught that reasoning is not there. So yeah. no matter how much, even the chaplain or he yeah. would try to help me, all I heard and all I seen was what I was taught to believe. When you couple it with the emotional trauma, what was going on and just- and Desperation, yeah. yeah. You, you just feel like you just, you do what you need to do and what you know, and that's what I turned to. And so moving forward um, about, 
half a year. We we went through a lot, John. I, I won't even go into all that, but it, it, we went we went through a lot. But uh, Joshua was weaned from the ventilator, which is a miracle. Um, I had to live separate from my family because they had to ambulance fly Joshua to the University of Utah. So I, I he was in the ICU for like what 33, 34 or some days, and then I was in uh, Reno apart from my family. Um, in the hospital, I never left his side, not once for three months. My daughter and I would take turns, um, rotating shifts to take care of Josh. Uh, we never left the room. I literally pretty much starved to death because I would not leave his room at, at all. He was too sick. Um, and then I lived an additional six months, um, once he was discharged at an apartment with Joshua and another one of my kids to help me with Josh because we would rotate taking care of him. And, um, so I lived apart from my family for a, almost eight months. That was all for therapy for him too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was going to therapy. Yeah, and three months of acute inpatient care, and then and then another six months of outpatient care. So that's why they they came out to uh, to Utah, and then um, I would come out and visit every, every couple, two you know, weeks as or much something. as I could. You know, in between work, bring the kids out for visit, give her a break from the hospital. Force her to leave because she was like, I'm not going. <laughs> but, so I uh, get a break once in a while. <laughs> yeah, you know, just claw marks on the floor as I drug her out of the, the hospital room to give her six hours of rest. But, wow. Um, yeah, not to make light of it, but I, I try to interject humor to keep he her does. smiling. He does. It helps me because I'll cry if I I think it's our, I know it's her coping mechanism, and I, if I can help that out, then. I'm glad you are because, like I said, I'm I'm struggling to keep my composure. There, again, there's so many similarities between you and all of. I'm sure you're aware of this. You've been in the support groups, all of the other people. Whenever you get cut off, nobody comes to help you. Nobody, and it doesn't matter if you were a saint and you decided to leave the cult, or if you're the lowest sinner and you decided to leave the cult. They treat them equally, the same. We're not going to help you. I'll never forget. When I got cut off, I got cut off for asking a question, and I, I understand they have to suppress the question. They have to stop other people people from learning of the question. But my wife wasn't asking the questions. They cut her off with me because she was married to me, and then nobody comes after us to not a single time, like none of the family, none of the friends, to say to plead with us and beg to come back to Jesus. To, to their Jesus, I should say, not to the Jesus, but the, the message Jesus, right? Nobody comes to plead with you. And then, like you said, to you know, on top of this, all of the things you're going through that had to have been very, very difficult. How did you, how were you able to overcome the trauma from all of that? Moving forward, um, yes, it, it still, it still tormented me. I still believe that I had to leave my husband. Um, but he made it better being there. So I had just made peace with the fact that this is what I need instead of what I was told. Um, by time we were able to be together as a family and my, we would take, we always prayed at night, um, with Joshua and as a family and Joshua would ask me, Hey mom, why don't you pray tonight? And I said, I can't. And he's like, mom, I don't believe what they are saying to you. And I said, and that, that's what really, it's, that's what woke me up was it's, that's where it started is I was like, why would my son, who's probably the biggest Christian I've ever met in all my life. He is just the kindest soul you'll ever meet. I mean, this, this kid would give you the shirt off his back. He is just that sweet and that kind hearted. It's just, it's genuine. It's genuine love. It's not even a religious love. It's just genuine. And I was just like, my son, who's went through hell and back, even died and came back, is telling me he doesn't believe that God doesn't hear my prayer. And it it messed with me. And I just remember I would cry all the time thinking God did not love me. And I would go into Walmart or whatever grocery store, and I would get a random call from somebody, and they'd say, hey, God just put you on my heart to let you know he loves you. And I would just sob. I would sob and sob and like, God loves me. And I didn't believe it, John. I still didn't believe it. And this would happen a lot where people would just call me and say, God put you on my heart. 
And I was told that, and they would tell me, I was told to shun you, but I can't get rid of this burden. And he told me to tell you he loves you. And so that's what started me with my search. And I had a friend that because of Joshua's situation and what the church said to her, to them, sorry, I almost said, she started to do her own investigation. And that led her to some of the podcasts from Rod Burgers, they say, right? Brigid. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, Rod. Close enough. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But yeah, she just, she just said, they, you know, I, I will love you. She came to peace with her own, um, recognition of what the, what the message meant to her and how it was not. I'll just leave that for her story. For me, she just said, I will love you no matter what. I am here for you. You just, if just if you feel like you can listen to these, it might help you to identify some of the suffering you're feeling because there's a lot of people with their testimonies that share very similar things that you're going through. And, and at the time, I put it off for probably six months maybe. And then I finally sat down and listened to it. And I just, I had fear. I had so much fear just to listen to the podcast. Why? That is so ridiculous if you think about it now. But I had fear and I was scared because you're taught you can't, you know, that they're possessed with spirits and don't, oh, that's just nothing but the devil. When I started listening to the podcast, I didn't feel the spirit of the devil. I felt love and peace for the first time. And as Rod is explaining his journey, which was to prove the message right, he came across that crossroad where you have your cognitive distance it takes in it's like if i say that this is right or if i say this is wrong and then you start to rationalize like why it would what it would do to you but i was already in a bad place anyway i i had already been shunned anyway so i was like why am i fearing this and then rod brought in a scripture and you could probably read it john it's in deuteronomy what is it 22 20 it's where it says, do not fear. If a prophet says something that's not in my name, do not fear. It is not I. That right there, I had to repeat that in my head over and over and over and over. Do not fear. It is not I. And that was what helped me to push through that block and it's a block. It really is. And they use the fear. As, people ask, why don't you leave the cult? If you did, if you weren't happy in the cult, why didn't you leave? And people like you and me, we were happy in it. That's the irony of all of this. But then once don't you... Don't let you be happy. Yeah, exactly. Don't it's, don't be happy. It's like the happiness of a child who's whistling as they go through the graveyard. That's the happiness that this thing <laughs> brings, right? But then they hold you with that same fear of the demons coming out of that graveyard. So you're this timid, scared little kid, and and you call that happiness. It's like the like the fake Jesus they have. They also have this weird fake happiness that I've I've learned. And once you leave, you start to experience what true happiness is, and it's just night and day difference. Yeah, for me. I was kind of afraid to really start seeing the truth. Uh, and, and the truth would be the reality of the lies that we were told. Um, that was hard. And I think, okay, so he's not listening to this right now. My pride to tell him I was wrong. That was a big one because I knew <laughs> I had to go say something to him and say, guess what? And I did not want to hear. I knew it. I did not want to hear it. <laughs> I was too close to her. You know, everything that I said, like, no, 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 You can't say that. No, no, no. And then she'd come back with me. Well, she didn't say, well, everything you said was right. This is what I found out. I'm like, yeah, that's everything I was saying, but I won't say it. <laughs> that's okay. As long I'm, as you got it one way or another, I, I don't need credit for it. <laughs> I'm still working on that. Everything my wife says is right. And if it's not right, it's still right. <laughs> yeah. You can be right or you can be happy, right? Is that how that works? No, I'm pretty sure that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was amazing watching 
the transformation, uh, you know, just from that first, like she said, I'm going to crack the book open a little bit, look with one eye, you know, yeah. to, I mean, you know, I, I talked to her on the phone. What are you doing? Watch podcasts. Like, I was why, always why that listening. Work? I come home. <laughs> watching podcasts. What are you doing? Go watch podcasts. Okay. And I lay down and watch them with her. And I'm like, I got to learn a lot too, you know, yeah. a lot of the, the research behind everything and kind of some of the reasons why they were. And it actually helped me to have a better understanding of, why she was, how she was, and how this was affecting, but her core system of beliefs had just been shattered. You know, yeah. it was, I felt like a child waking yeah, up. She was literally just realizing, you know, what life is slowly becoming again, and it's not what she's used to, what she grew up with, or what yeah. she had lived. And yeah, uh, that was both challenging, emotional, and heartbreaking, and also fulfilling to watch her blossom and develop, and to realize that all this stuff that she's been feeling, all this negativity is just out of the fear of what she was used to and not yeah. reality. I mourned like a death for four months. Didn't I cry for like four months realizing how I was lied to my whole life? Was there a lot of good? Yeah, I had a lot of good in my life. I had bad too, but it's the fact that you believe from your core that this is real and it's not. I think that was just as devastating as my family not being there for me. I, I think in their minds and their hearts, they believed that they could be there for me all that they could, all that they were allowed to. But they didn't even come out and see Joshua and I for five years. Wow. But it was because my daughter had her baby and, you know, it, it legitimized the reason to come out. So, Michael, we've got your face on the camera so we can see your expression firsthand. And I'm curious, did she tell you you're learning about this message thing new, right? Had, did she tell you that the guy had a magical sword? I, I don't think I've ever told him. That. No, there's just things I didn't tell him because how do you, how do you make sense of that? I, I got to hear this. I'm sorry. That's he why, doesn't know, that's John. My reaction here so, is like, so first time for the world, we get to see Mike's expression whenever we tell him that William Branham had a magical sword. And I'll let you tell him, Faye. Sorry. <laughs> was when I was being turned over to the devil um, when we were uh, about a year before we got married. This is the first time they attempted and we had a... It's actually the day of your divorce. The day of my divorce. It was the first time I got to see my children, uh, my two daughters. Um, I, 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 was, I had mixed feelings of going and seeing them because it had to be under supervision at my family member's house. And... Um, I, I told him, I'm like, here's what's going to happen. And it's, it can go one way or, or the other. And I told him he needed to stay out in the car. Cause I said, they will not welcome you. And he's like, no problem. And sure enough, it was exactly what I prepared him for. And I think that was the wake up call of what I was really in. He had no idea. Um, they, well, the family came out and got me out of the car. So you're just as much involved. Get on in here. I'm like, he here had no go. idea. Like he, I kept trying, thinking I was converting my husband, or at the time, my um, boyfriend, but thinking I was converting him, I would tell him, oh, there's just so much love, and yeah, that's not what he was introduced to. Yeah. Not at all. I kept quiet, and I kept quiet on the couch, and I can just remember my fingernails digging into my hand. I was just like, the more it went on, the more it got. When we got back to the hotel, I showed him my hand. There was these marks from my nails where they dug into my skin and almost started bleeding. I was like, I was so upset with the way he they were treating or what they were saying. You know, and they, you know, asked me, how do you play it? And why, why are you involved? I'm like, well, you know, I'm help. I love her and I'm taking care of the kids too. I'm giving them an education. And they're like, they don't need education. They just need the love of God. And that's the, you know. We'd rather them do that than get any kind of schooling. I, I didn't understand that. Because I was I'm like, why can't you yeah. have both? <laughs> I mean, you know, I grew up with both. I mean, I went to a church of God and I went to high school and, you know, public yeah. school and everybody went to college. And That was one thing they told me is I wasn't even allowed to talk to him because he wasn't even, uh, they called him a Christian. He's not even a Christian. He's like, I'm not a Christian. So what they meant was he's not message. Right. And didn't that make you just want to join? <laughs> oh yeah, yes. Yeah, it's a good recruiting poster, you know. It's it's really unbelievable. It's like <clears throat> they twist the salvation so much that they've they've taken it completely away from 
what Jesus did on the cross in the Bible, right? It, salvation only comes if you accept the message. And then there's this weird thing where if you were part of the message and you accepted this fake salvation with this fake Jesus, if you ever leave that, then the God is not strong enough to put, to bring you back. Like you mentioned the 90 and 9 passage, and I grew up with those songs. We actually sang it in message churches. There were 90 and 9, but he left the fold to find the one little lost lamb. That's the that's the one I was trying to talk to you. <laughs> exactly. I knew, it, to the, I knew it was. The fold the yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they will sing the song, but then actions speak louder than words, right? When it comes to reality, when they when there's they have the chance to go after the one lost sheep. Well, William Branham said the story himself. You, you break the sheep's leg so it doesn't leave the fold, so you don't have to go after it. That was his idea of salvation. <laughs> I'm looking at Michael's face. That was an actual doctrine in this thing. You bl break the sheep's leg. I think for Michael, the biggest, the biggest one, because again, as we've been trying to share, I was trying to convert him. He was trying to convert me, or at least help me to come out. If nothing else, he didn't try to change me though. I, I, I really need that to come across. Yeah, he I never mean, tried to change. I think convert's me. a strong word. I, I let yeah. you do what you wanted to do, but you know, I also wanted you to find some kind of reason within it all to, to, to keep it all in perspective, right? You know? But I think the the hardcore no for him is when I I was I had him listen to one of the messages and it was his life story and on the life story, um, William Random was saying, "Yeah, I'll let you tell it." <laughs> well, we went for a ride in my truck and it's a funny story. Before it, we get in and you know I turn the key on and here comes the heavy metal on my radio and she looks over at me and goes. You're still listening to that? And I <laughs> grew up with it. I, I like this music. I'm sorry. I listen to it now, guys. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. I, I know she gets embarrassed when I say that, but it's so funny. It is so cute, but it, it just plays into our dynamic. And then yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. You know, I'll, I'll take it off. She's like, well, let's listen to this. And she puts on the life story. And I don't know, a few minutes into it, I hear, you know, a woman ain't worth a clean bullet to kill her with. And I said, shut it off. <laughs> shut it off. I've heard enough. That, that does it to yep. me. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I believe, you know, women should have just as much as men and I'm not, that, that doesn't even play with me. You know, I just, it doesn't yeah. resonate with me whatsoever. I don't understand it, but now I understand the dynamic of how the, the way I was treated, a woman is respected and treated in this religion. And I was like, nope, I'm out. Sorry. <laughs> that was your four and a half minutes. I have admitted it. more of my life than I ever cared to admit. So Speaking of the heavy metal, the, the weak God of the message, the people who are in the message feel that if they hear this, they're going to hell just for listening to it. And I keep Blame on my desk, me. I keep this doll, There's of the kiss doll, so, <laughs> so that, so that it, th this scares away message people. So I, I have no fear. I have this little kiss doll. <laughs> uh, well, good. I was like, well, what about Christian heavy metal? Same thing. It's got to be. I'm like. I, I don't get it. I mean, this is a good message. It reaches people on a level that they're willing to listen. You know, kids, you know, I listened to some Christian heavy metal. I loved it. You know, I mean, it was great music, you know, and, but, uh, yeah, it was just, it was just, it was a hard no, hard no, hard no. All right, baby, I'll, I'll respect you while you're in the car. <laughs> so I mean, we learned the, our give and take with each other, you yeah. know, so, but I didn't even realize I was so judgy. I, I look back, I have friends that they see that I'm out and they're like, do you remember when you judged me? Oh, and I'm like, oh, that happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's really unbelievable because when I was in the message, I was like that too. And I, I'm embarrassed. The people that I knew when I was in the message, I'm embarrassed to go around them because I was a judgy freak, judgmental freak. But <clears throat> having studied the Bible after leaving and understanding, they twisted the context of so many things to turn them into like there's this righteous indignation where they believe that if they can insult you they're bringing their self higher into heaven and it makes no sense all of the passages about judging are not 
to insult other people, but to discern for yourself, to think for yourself, to examine for yourself. Judge, judge this thing, right? Judge and make, make some sense of this thing because you may be going down the wrong path. It's that type of judgment. <clears throat> but instead, it's this, let's insult you. Let's, if you're listening to something we don't allow as our rules, let's insult you because that's going to make you go to heaven, buddy. So ridiculous now, but... <laughs> I thought I was helping him, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's amazing how far we've grown. That's why I say we're in a good place because I am enjoying life for the first time. I, I like to tell him, I feel like I'm like, it's this, I hate to use the word two year old, but two year olds, that's they, they're getting to know they're, they're getting to know and explore things. And I feel like for the first time I can look and see people for who they are instead of judging them for who they are. And love them and love them for their differences. And I love that. I love that freedom. Yeah. Another, fun, another quick little funny story that really kind of says it all. And she's going through all this and they're telling her she backslid. This is later when I, I knew I was you know, out. It's like, I'll show them backslid. Out comes the first tattoo that she got. So. <laughs> <laughs> and piercings. <laughs> I'll show them backslid. I've often thought about getting a tattoo of a skull with a halo on my arm. So if you know anybody, that- <laughs> if you're ever this way, I could definitely do your uh, your skull with the halo tattoo. I'm a tattoo artist now. As a matter of fact, we're in my studio as we speak in my tattoo studio. I'll never forget. I felt so little whenever we went to our first church after being in the message. <clears throat> and they were teaching us how wrong it was to be so insulting and judgmental to others. Because <laughs> like Mike has experienced, Michael has experienced, I'm certain, this is not how you convince people to join your religion, right? If you insult them to their face, <laughs> they're not going to be convinced to go to join you, right? <clears throat> and there was a person with tattoos who came into the church and you know how it was right Faye you <laughs> in the message oh no the body is the temple well let's decorate it that's <laughs> that's, how they, that's how they felt right <clears throat> but we listen to this you ever do the eye where you're looking but you try not to <laughs> <laughs> you know <clears throat> and so anyway we heard the sermon about that about you know the tattoos and how you should not judge people like this, but the people who are, everybody has something good on the inside. And if you can connect with that good, if they're not Christian, you tell them about the Jesus, the real Jesus, not the message Jesus. And then they can share God's love to the world too. And I felt so little at that moment because I realized that we based our whole religion on appearance and when I'm talking about appearance, I'm not talking about just the Pentecostal lifestyle, the <clears throat> dress code for the women. We took it to the extent that we wore <laughs> – one of the first stories I did, um, the the guy had written a song about faces. We, we wear these faces. <clears throat> and that's how it was. We wore these faces. They, they were masks. And that was our, our appearance of being righteous and our appearance of being good. And we were condemning – condemning genuinely good people and pushing them further away from God. And fortunately, we were pushing them away from the message God, which isn't the real one. I remember we would always put them in a box of like, oh, they're a good person. They go to church, but they're not message. You always had to identify that person as not being message. I don't know why we were raised that way, but it was just a <clears> fact. <throat> You identified somebody, whether they're message or not. It's a very us versus them mentality. It breaks my heart to see the people that are still in it. Um, I find my, I found for a, a while, it took, it took me a while in my journey to feel comfortable to live my life for me. Um, instead of trying to be scared, like I, I would be afraid to wear pants and and having a, a piercing and my mom seeing it or my dad seeing it. Cause I love them. You know, I respect my family, but I think one day it just hit me. Um, when I recognized that this, this was a, can I say cult, John? Absolutely. This was a cult, pure, plain and simple. I would go into people's homes and I still love these people to this day. 
And they have a picture of William Branham, you know, what they believe is a halo, which we, we debunked that. And, and I was, and I just asked myself the simple question, am I living wrong or are they? And who's at real danger when you follow a man versus Jesus Christ? So I had to give myself that, that peace that it was okay for me to live my life the way I feel I'm living my life best for God, for myself. I, I can't live my life for someone else. That's not being true to myself anymore. I know that my family likes to label me as being backslid or I don't have the Holy Ghost. And um, that it just, it takes revelation. That's a big one. That's a big one. It's, everything's about revelation. But you know, when you, when you think about Jesus Christ and how he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And he gave us the Holy Ghost. So that is where I had to find my peace to live my life. Um, my family came out for the first time in five years. And I, I remember this conversation with my husband. Do I wear my jeans or do I wear something that would make them happy? And he said, don't you dare change a thing. You live your you live your life the way you're used to living your life, and it went well. I mean, did it hurt him? I'm sure it did. But be authentic to yourself. Yeah, I'm of the opinion that it works both ways. Well, they want you to wear the dresses when you're around them. Well, I think when you go to their house, they need to wear the pants. <laughs> I have so much to say about that. <laughs> I I will I will remain silent on this topic because it's a sore spot for me. <laughs> 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 but yes, I agree. <laughs> we are very hospitable to the people that come to our house. If you want to wear dresses, if you want to, however, you know, you worship God, we accept you for who you are. And that's, that's our home. That's our love to you. Mm -hmm. We don't tell you how you need to live. We don't tell you how you're supposed to dress. We don't tell you that you can or cannot watch TV in our home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, see, my family grew up with the Branham family, and what everybody doesn't know is that the Branham family all had TVs, and they, my William Branham himself would take my grandparents and my uh, aunts and uncles to the movie theaters, and all while he's condemning these people for doing it, he's he's doing it himself in private, and again, it comes back to this thing of faces. It's all about can I can I create the appearance of looking more holy than the rest of the people that I'm scorning and I'm and insulting because if I can give that appearance, then they'll think that I'm a better Christian. Yeah. yeah. And that's really what it's about. It's just, it's all a farce, sadly. I know one thing that was striking to me when we went to Indiana and we actually went into, they were, the kids were having a, uh, I don't know. At the gym. At it, the gym, For right? the youth. You walk in and big picture William Branham, itty bitty picture Jesus. And I was like, <laughs> Honey, front center, off to the side, footnote. I, she's like, shh. <laughs> uh, I was like, that was one of my first realizations. Like, this thing is completely backwards. But, you know, I just a side note. But back to, I would like to chime in on, on what she has shown me and the way she has just developed and blossomed in there, who she really was supposed to be has just been, I, I couldn't have asked for more in my lifetime to be able to see that. And, and she is a testament to other people um, on how things can really be. I, I know she has affected so many people's lives. I hear all the time and people say, you know, I've been following you, watching your transformation yes. and you just, oh. been, it, you know, you made me believe that I could do the same thing. And she's given strength and courage to a lot of people who are still living in that fear that they don't have to, that they can be themselves, that, that they can truly get away, that they can truly make a change in their lives if they want to. They can do the research and figure it out for themselves. And that's what we always say, don't, you know, don't take my word for it. I, I went through my own, I, I mean her, went through my own soul searching, went through my own research, went through my own having to change my core beliefs you know, based on what I now know to be true and what I now know to be false. Um, but the, the inspiration that she gives others is just, um, it, I thrive on that and I, I commend her for it and I love her for it. And that's one of the reasons why I knew I could never live without her is because I could see that in her, 
message or no message, she always had that in her heart that she cared about people and, um, you know, and then she was able to go through this and now she's helping other people. Yeah. I have people that reach out to me and I don't try to give them the answers. I try to lead them to do their own research. I feel like that is very pivotal to their growth and, and what they need to decide. Um, but I've had a lot of women reach out to me and ask me how I escaped. And John, do you have any comments on this? It's, this is hard for women. This is, I, I mean, that are trapped with children and, and um, married. And it's, it's their whole family, their whole community supports, you know, possibly the man or just the religion itself. Do you have it- any words? It is really hard, and that's one of the biggest things that is the battle for the women, right? Because they weren't given the tools to succeed in life. Pure, plain, and simple. That's for If you're a female in this, you're not given the tools to succeed. <clears throat> My advice is always, as soon as you're aware that you have to leave, make an exit strategy. Don't immediately leave. Don't put yourself into a place where you're going to be without food or shelter. Make a strategy, and that strategy might be going to school to get an education or be, you know, get some job so that you can support yourself. <clears throat> it's really hard, especially in this economy. It's really hard um, when you've not established yourself. But no matter how you do it, make an ex- exit strategy. Build a community of people around you, real people. The, I know we have the support groups in Facebook and whatnot, but you need a real person, a real human who's with you, who can support you. There are great churches that offer support and help. You can go explain your situation, and unlike the fake Jesus message thing where they help only their cult kind, you'll find other churches that will help you whether you're a saint or a sinner or not even a Christian, they want to show you the love of God and they'll give you some help. So if you are in that situation, try to establish establish yourself with people that can help you and people that can support you. Yeah, unfortunately, I know when you turn to the ministers in our churches, they always told the woman it was her job to live such a life to where it it convicts and and converts their husband but that's not real that's not reality and that does not help somebody that's in an abusive situation so um thank you for that advice yeah i i come across that a lot with people that reach out to us so Faye, you've been through so many things and it's amazing to watch how you've came through all of this and came out better on the other side if you could look back to your younger self in the message and give some advice to your younger self, what would you say to yourself? I think if I was to give some advice or to help somebody, for me, once I stopped caring about the way people looked at me and viewed me and what I thought that they thought about me, I... I finally felt happy. I finally felt free. And that was the biggest thing for me is I stopped giving them power. I, it, it doesn't, they don't have power over you anymore when you don't, you don't let it bother you. You don't care. You, you live, you live through this experience of I'm me now. I, I have me back. I, I don't, I don't need to worry that with that burden anymore, it doesn't have power over me now. And I think that's what has truly given me my happiness. Excellent. Well, I'm so glad that you've both came through this and very good to talk to you. I know that all of our listeners are going to really enjoy this um, and, and it will be encouraging to a lot of people. There are a lot of people who are on the edge of thinking about leaving the message, especially now that, you know, the current events that it, it has caused a mass exodus to start forming and people need others to show that we can be successful after we leave and especially with everything that you both have been through you are one of the greatest success stories that i am aware of ever seeing it's it is amazing and it's through you and what you've sacrificed too, your lifeline that you've given us so we thank you well thank you 
Well, if you've enjoyed the show and you want more information, you can check us out on the web. You can find us at william-branham.org. For an overview of the historical research of William Branham and the healing revivals, read Preacher Behind the White Hoods, a critical examination of William Branham and his message, available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible.